Very good morning, also from my side. <laughs> it is a very diverse program, I must say, what we have here on the different talks. So uh, my aim is now, my name is Thomas Altmann, and maybe if you look to the agenda of today, it was foreseen that Marcel Korova should be here. He's my colleague coming from the Netherlands, but on personal reasons he cannot be here, and he asked me to step in. So I'm not from the Netherlands, I'm from Germany, but uh, nevertheless, I would like to bring you a little bit attention to the cleaning and disinfection we are making with manufacturing equipments in the cosmetic industry. And uh, here we really see that removing cosmetic residues is done in a way sometimes what is not very effective. And uh, I will come to that in a minute, how we are trying to sort this out and give you a few examples of uh, how we are trying to help and assist. But maybe we will just start simply why we set it up this talk here. So we were discussing on cleaning all the time in different industries. So for the cosmetic industry, what we saw is that the global rebound in personal care market in 2021 uh, was growing up to 8%. So that means that there is a lot of yeah, costs pressure on raw materials and even also the energy costs what are at the moment climbing up like hell. And we are getting a lot of questions how we could maybe be more sustainable in the future. And this is the, the aim of today, to give you an idea of what can be done. I will use a few examples and uh, yeah, maybe you can even identify what could be possible also on your side. So what we also have, the intensive market competition, and that also shows very often that you have to increase the productivity and even the capacities or the production capacity uh, and the agility of production in cosmetics. So when, we are, when I'm at the customer side and I know exactly that the people are producing like a white cream, what we would call the sun lotion or whatever, and want to do afterwards a foundation. Um, they have to have a program in place to clean right first time. And that makes it for sure possible to be very agile also on your production side. So to have the possibility to work with a standard cleaning procedure, what gets you a right first time cleaning. That will also be the main issue here to cut the costs and to be competitive. This is what we even see in yeah, big corporate accounts we are dealing with, that sites are competing with each other, that they want to have a yeah, better carbon footprint or that they are really trying to make a kind of, yeah, we can use in one shift, we can make three products on one of the equipments and not only two. So these kind of competition is what is also existing at the moment. So overall, I want to talk about the optimization and even also on not only the cleaning, but also the disinfection procedures. And why do we do that? And what, what do we do here? So we have three goals predominantly. We want to increase the production capacity. And if we don't do that, we have sometimes long downtimes for cleaning. And even unexpected is what we mean with, oh, the operator cleaned it in accordance to a certain program. And then he realized he's opening up the equipment. Shit, it's not clean. I have to reclean it. So then you are in the position that they say, oh, what do I do? Very often they do exactly the same cleaning they have done before, even if they have seen it was not working. So they do it then again. And this is what really needs to unexpected times that people say, oh, we wanted to have the next batch ready already this morning. Why is it not finished now? Yeah, we had to reclean the vessel. And this is why we are now at two o'clock and yeah, we are still not ready with the, the, with the batch. So this is something what we really try to avoid just to have even a better, yeah, I would say production capacity planning even. Then if you do a proper cleaning, it makes sure for you that you can get this kind of yeah, guarantee that you can start the next batch after the cleaning. Secondly, we want to protect the operators because we see in the industry sometimes even manual cleaning using high alkaline, high acid products, or they are dealing with temperatures that the goggles get blind very quickly because they have high melting waxes they want to clean. So these kind of situations is what we also 
want to yeah, look at and give maybe also a way out for that. The third one is then the cost reduction and the sustainability approach. So for example, the high consumption of water, energy and labor. And I've been lately in discussion with a company in France. They were telling me, oh, we are just making easy to clean cosmetics, like body washes, like hair shampoos and so on. So we do not need a lot of uh, energy for cleaning. We are just making water rinses. But at the end of the day, if we looked to the water consumption because of the fact that these products are high foaming, they have installed a lot of yeah, cleaning cycles, but just using water. And we outlined that is possible to reduce. So if you, for example, use a defoamer for the first flush out of the system, then we were going from 1000 liter we needed up to now to rinse this 100 kilo mixer. Um, up to 200 liters only. So that was an 80% of reduction of the water usage just by a little bit of adding a defoamer. And the same is true, for example, when we talk about energy. So I have a lot of customers at the moment when you come to their sites and you ask them, what do you do for microbiological uh, safety of your equipment? Yeah, we make hot water sanitization like 60 to 80 degrees, 20 minutes or half an hour. And that is for me something where we even can outline this energy might be saved. But we will come to that a little later. And why do we do all of that? Why do we care about cleaning and these kind of things? Because yeah, the guidelines telling us, so the GMP guideline, the cosmetic GMP, cleaning is eliminating the visible dirt. So there's a minimum the minimum requirement for the uh, good manufacturing practice is that you start off the next batch with a visual clean equipment. And even it is outlining that cleaning and sanitization should be performed at appropriate intervals. That also means you have to understand how often do you have to do that. Can I prepare three batches of the same product subsequent after each other, maybe just not with a water rinse in between, or do I need a water rinse, or do I have to do a full cleaning? Because I want to get the information, what is the most yeah, process I can trust on and what gives me the best product quality. If you're exporting to the US, even sometimes over the counter, because drugs are existing, like anti-dandruff shampoos or when you make claims on sun protection and so on, then you should even identify if these kind of over-the-counter over drugs should be not validated in a more pharmaceutical way. And this is what a lot of our customers are doing. So if we look to the different points we have to consider for cleaning, it's what people call tact or the Zinner circle, so that we have temperature, we have the action, we have the chemical concentration, and we have the time for cleaning. And I would like to give you some real life examples to just give you a little bit of an idea of what we are doing. What you should take away is then, uh, yeah, how to get ideas of maybe optimizing the cleaning and disinfection procedures on your sites, or even what kind of discussions you stu should start with your operators. So for me, normally, a cleaning looks like that. We have an end of production. There is the so-called dirty hole time. Can also have an influence on the, water co uh, on the cleanability of a product. If it's drying out, is it then harder to clean? Or if it's like an yeah, waxy, oily product, it is not even yeah, considered as critical. Then sometimes you make a pre-rinse, a detergent cleaning, and then something for sanitization or disinfection. And the end, you have a clean hold time and you should start the production. If we talk about the cleaning itself, we have the possibility to work with these kind of yeah, tagged or zinner circle uh, attributes. We have a time, we have a mechanical action for cleaning, we have a chemistry, and we require a certain temperature. And with these parameters, you can really play. And you have the ability to question things. Because this is what I see people are doing too little at the moment. They are saying, oh, I'm cleaning this mixer since 20 years like that at 80 degrees. And I don't know why, because they, they are thinking high temperature is good for cleaning. Sometimes this is true if we talk about waxy or oily soils. But 
it is also true that some residues, some product residues, might be better removable using lower temperatures. So I want to give you the first example now on how to increase the production capacity to avoid these kind of long downtime cleanings or even these unexpected cleaning failures. The situation was that, yeah, this was the equipment and uh, people had to re-clean this after this cream was produced frequently. So they were losing manufacturing time due to cleaning because you want to have your equipment ready for production and not spend a lot of time on cleaning. Also, the labor utilization is utilized because if you are installing a proper detergent, you do not have to have so many manual handling on the system usually. And if you have this under control, these unexpected schedule delays for recleaning are not happening anymore. So what do we do now? Usually we are trying to make, first of all, a grouping strategy so that we look to the different formulation types existing on site. We try to identify what is the worst case product here, maybe based on the highest content of titanium dioxide with iron oxides inside or whatever, and then also what is maybe even in this worst case product a complete cleaning process. So, and then we would like to use this effective cleaning process also for easier to clean products. This is a standard approach also coming from the pharmaceutical industry. They are doing exactly the same, defining a worst case of a product, doing the cleaning, and then they say, oh, all the others belonging to the same group of formulation type, maybe gabopool gels or whatever, um, they are cleaned in the same way. And if we have done that in a good way, um, then you have really a very good chance to have a very good structure for cleaning in your s facility. Typical problems what we see is for example high mineral loads, waxy soils, silicones or even yeah, over-the-counter drug ingredients, titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, fluorides, whatever. And with this we are then trying to even identify also what kind of uh, yeah, cleaning is with there. But also if you get new ingredients on site, so the Cosmetic research and development is very innovative, I would say. And I know some of the uh, yeah, global players have even outlined on their website, we have like 20 to 30% of our portfolio renewed every year. And this is where they include new ingredients. So you have to have an idea if these new ingredients are also more critical for cleaning or are they easier to clean. And this is what Ecolib is norm normally doing to assist with. First of all, to identify what is the cleanability overall, so what is the cleaning agent uh, to be used. And even if there are new ingredients, we are running lab trials, and I just give you a protocol here, to make a kind of yeah, decision, is this belonging to a specific group of formulation or not? So what we are doing is normally we are trying to identify, so we are getting different products, maybe with the same formulation type, but with different colorations. And then it was asked if there is a chance to identify what of these masses is harder to clean. So this is like a lipstick mass here and has a really di completely different colors. And so we then identify this kind of worst cases and try to make this cleaning as effective as possible. You see we have different methods, different methodologies. So this is to apply residues or products, here product residues on a stainless steel coupon. We have beaker studies and we have even some small scale mixers in our technical area where we can go up to like five kilos for production also then for real life cleaning. Um, the different methods are used to identify here is very little mechanical action. It's just moving in and out of the solution. So as a yeah, solution would run down the sidewall of a tank. Here's a stirrer inside during the cleaning that gives more mechanical action. And here it's even a spray ball or rotary jet inside where you can have a lot of mechanical action. And that should help us to identify, is it easy to clean? Is it medium to clean or really hard to clean? And we are giving always this kind of laboratory cleaning trials 
with, a, uh, with the uh, information to our customers to get to a point that they say, oh, I have to use a certain cleaning regime to be sure that this is the most effective one, what I have on site. Because this is then the question, what is often not from my perspective uh, good answered. If you ask the, the operators, why do you clean it like that? Yeah, sometimes they say the equipment manufacturer told us to clean this equipment like this. Or, yeah, based on the experience, we have taken this process from another mixer and it was working. Yeah, but they do not have really the understanding of what drives the cleaning in real life. So here we have a case study for making a case study for decreasing the downtimes. We had here a cosmetic manufacturer with highly pigmented formulations. And yeah, the, the protocol was not very effective. So what did we do? We made some laboratory cleaning trials to make then afterwards the discussion with our customer, how can the cleaning happen on your side? And then at the end also to talk about the validation strategy of this procedure. This is then also something where we outline if you know you need a certain temperature for the cleaning to be effective, then you should control that the temperature is reached or is below. That is the kind of validation you should do to just make sure yeah, every parameter I was seeing that it's important for cleaning is done, is, is correctly. So that was the mixer at this customer and they said, yeah, we always have to re-clean it. So you can see this is a foundation, iron oxide containing titanium dioxide and they always had challenges that at the side wall after cleaning they had this fine dust of particles with titanium and iron oxide what you can easily wipe away with a towel uh, what you impregnated with alcohol. So we were doing these kind of uh, studies because they told us up to five hours is what we need to clean this small mixer. And we said okay that's maybe not an ideal situation. And you can see what we are doing then is we are giving the outlook of the dirty coupons. So this is now a coupon study uh, to be equal to what the customer sees on site. So this is what they get to know. Oh yeah, this is a dried on residue as I also see it in practice. And then you can even see here the imprint of this material where you have the chance to identify there are formulations easy to clean but still leave this kind of pigment residues on the plates and there is a formulation what is even possible to remove it completely. So we made also studies at different temperatures and that was for me the best example that this concentration here of the detergent at 80 degrees C was not as effective as it is with 60 degrees Celsius. And this is what we see very often. If you have high mineral loads, a higher cleaning temperature leads to the fact that the minerals are going out of the yeah, fatty, oily matrix they are in and then they tend to stick on the stainless steel. So we very often clean at lower temperatures today because this is also giving you a blank stainless steel but um, this is much more effective at 60 degrees. And even if we compare this to a classical food and beverage alkaline cleaner, what is also in use at this customer for easy to clean products, it was even yeah, good to see that this kind of formulation can do a little bit on the residue, but it's not as effective as a detergent what is designed for cosmetic residues. So overall, we have now a cleaning time reduced from five hours to around 20 minutes. I think with the pre-rinse we are going up to 30 minutes, but yeah, that was also prepared by marketing this slide. And we have here this kind of uh, cleaning procedure implemented where we make the pre-rinse already with the detergent. So we are not rinsing with water before to save the water and that could really help us to keep the, yeah, metrics intact and it was something where the customers outlining I was rinsing before with hot water and if this is not necessary and I can yeah, just decline these steps and make a final rinse after that, that is even a, a saving in water as well. 
So let's see safety protection of operators. As I said, manual protocols with harsh chemistries. If you are in a manufacturing, you often see these kind of situations. You have different preparation vessels, maybe for premixes, and they are cleaned manually. And you can already see how engaged this operator is because he's trying to get in and get really the last bit out of uh, from the bottom, uh, having even sometimes different cleaning solutions in different bassins uh, where the cleaning should happen. And this can be done sometimes even with uh, yeah, foam cleaning or immersion bases or an automatic cleaning here. So soaking is what we would call you dismantle the equipment and you put it into a bath and clean it manually afterwards or a cleaning off place automation where you have a parts washer, for example. And that is what we made as a, yeah, as a study here with this customer that they had foundations, creams and serums to be cleaned. Exactly also pigments, sunscreens and waxes were in there. And the process was partly they were giving the concentrated detergent into these tanks and then to wipe it with the detergent and this yeah, aggressive detergent over the surface and then come in contact. He is using gloves, but yeah, you never know how this ends up. And we were then going to the solution that we said, if we are taking a cabinet parts washer for this situation, we are making the employment employees contact with the cleaning chemicals uh, completely out. This is a customized rack so that you can even place very odd shaped parts to it and even hose cleaning and the automated data collection also for cleaning validation afterwards. So here, this kind of situation was leading to the fact then that in the cleaning area, there were nine full-time equivalents, uh, three, uh, nine FTEs working. Due to the parts washer, they reduced it to three. So the operators are now able to produce more products, go into another area for the production instead of doing the manual cleaning all the day. Now the last step here, the cost reduction and sustainability targets, high, uh, yeah, high water load and uh, energy prices. And this is what we see, yeah, the gas price is at the moment, yeah, rising up like nothing else. And we are trying to reduce here the energy for cleaning and disinfection. So we are trying to sell chemical disinfectants at ambient temperature instead of hot water sanitization at high temperatures. We choose purpose-built detergents to keep the concentrations low as possible and get the right first time cleaning, so to avoid recleanings, and even to make the cleaning at the correct temperature. So if you have high mineralic residues or silicons, identify what cleaning temperature is the best one and use that. So for us, we are having these kind of yeah, detergents. So we are really a provider to make this kind of work together with our customers to update the cleaning and disinfection protocols. And at the end also to choose the right detergent. And just to give you one idea, uh, if you are, for example, making EcoCert or Cosmos certified organic cosmetics, then you have a requirement to use specific detergents. And we have even different kinds of these materials because if you're making a non-organic product before, you have to do a cleaning operation with the yeah, EcoCert certified or Cosmos certified detergent. You make your organic product and you make the cleaning again with the EcoCert product. This is also the compliance. And a lot of people are not aware that these kind of cosmetic detergents are existing, that they are built with materials what can be certified even to these associations like Cosmos uh, or EcoCert. So when we look to the third case study, this is the energy intensive disinfection. So hot water 
sanitization or hot water disinfection. I would more call it sanitization because we are not so sure how much of the bugs are killed at the desired temperature. So this is using a large amount of water if you have a run-through system and it even takes sometimes hours to heat up and hold the vessels. But for me when I have these discussions, um, in this situation here there was the f tank to be filled up and then heated in the tank to get to the target temperature. Sometimes you have the possibility even to use hot water. But then you hold this for a specific time and after that you have to cool down to make the next product. And I've been on a site in uh, Poland where they make predominantly toothpastes and they have 32 holding tanks for different uh, pastes and each of them is cleaned and sanitized with hot water afterwards and it needs one and a half hour roughly to bring it down from the 80 degrees to ambient temperature. So you have half an hour to get the temperature up to the desired, then you hold it for 20 minutes and then you dump it. And if you do that, you can also think of maybe it's better to do a chemical disinfection because this is what you do at ambient temperature. So there's no heating required. You recirculate through the spray balls you are even using for the cleaning. And based on the product what you are taking, so they are taking here a very high uh, parasitic acid based product, a very very effective disinfectant. Five minutes is needed and you need a short rinsing cycle only. So this can then reduce the total sanitization time from four hours up to like 10 minutes and even with no involvement of energy. So this is what, what we are at the moment discussing a lot with our customers. So I just want to bring your attention back to, yeah, think of what kind of time, action, chemicals and temperature is available on your site and can you have improvements on that and even these real life examples should give you the idea of yeah what what is possible so if you have now uh, seen these kind of possibilities you can also visit us on, on our stand number eight we have different kind of detergents for different actions like as I said, yeah, they could be EcoCert certified, just standard alkaline or acid cleaner, some boosters for silicon oil removal, or even yeah, disinfectants and sanitizers to get rid of the high temperatures for uh, disinfection. And with that, I'm at the end and I'm looking forward to maybe some questions. <laughs>